Thursday. Yeah, yeah, it's Thursday. It's Thursday. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, now the time here, and I've just got a couple um, uh, regarding the place land. Um, the the basket is down there, um, and uh, yeah, just put uh, your copies in there. Uh, it might be helpful also if you had copies for all your readers. So Saturday, I don't need to make a bunch of copies for all your all your readers. Um, uh, they can help you down there, and it's kind of better if one at a time people are making those copies rather than eight at a time. So keep that in mind. Again, it's um, kind of first come, first serve. Uh, it's going to be Saturday over in the Mule Barn. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, does anybody have any questions about it? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Look at a work that uh, is newborn. And uh, I think that's everything in my will. So, hey, Chris. Okay, I have no weather report. I just have the weather plan for the day. Um, we, as everybody knows, Take Me to the River will be happening at um, Creighton as the lead center for performing arts. Element, you should all be good. Your bus and everything, it'll get you there. What I need is the people at the fort. Here's the plan for today. Um, we are actually had to move dinner indoors, so the people who are staying at the fort, everybody, your dinner will take place downstairs tonight in the bistro. Um, it's scheduled for 6 o'clock, not 5.30, and we'll have vans. If it's pouring rain, we will have vans that just start running that loop at starting at about 5.45 to get you down here. We also now have a bus that will get you to Creighton. It will be leaving from the bistro. So you need to know to be ready when you come over to dinner. The bus will leave from here for the night performance. And it'll probably be closer to 7, 7, 10, right around there, because the performance starts at 7, 30. So um, spread the word for those at the fort that you don't see here. I'll try to get the word out, but um, just know that's the weather plan for today. Um, and I, usually uh, right around this time in the week every year, I just put a little reminder in because it's a long week and everybody's been putting a lot of effort in. Take a breather and everybody needs to try to re-energize for those last couple days. There's some incredible plays that are going to be coming up in these next couple days. We all need to give our help and efforts and focus to those playwrights. And um, if we can do that, then we'll finish out really strong and wonderfully here. It's been, it's been great so far. Um, one other thing, Mark Costello uh, came up with a great idea. Um, he's going to put a sign-up sheet down by the registration desk uh, uh, for playwrights who have plays here now. If you want to get onto a Google, a special Google private group, and share your plays with the other playwrights who have been Play Lab and Main Stage playwrights here. He'll set that up for you so that you guys, if you weren't able to go see a reading, you'll be able to still read <coughs> those folks' works and even respond or talk back and forth with each other. Is that right, Mark? Yeah, I'm gonna put that sheet out like now. So, the, so like, the sooner you get something, I can get that thing set up and we can start. <coughs> Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, I, I have a quick announcement about the uh, movement workshop tomorrow. Uh, it's not in the description, but for those who are, are taking it, um, would you please bring a, a small chunk of text that could be in a dialogue form or a paragraph found text from any source is fine. Is that okay? It's okay, great, thanks. I want to say happy birthday to Boston and to Eliza. <laughs> And um, we're, our national audience is with us now, and we're going to turn it over to Eliza Beth. No applause? I'm just kidding. Oh. 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 Um, thanks, thanks for the booze and the applause. Um, so today's topic, dreamed up by the um, GPTC uh, staff, I just had a very spicy vindaloo party. <laughs> Uh, is the T and C the function and malfunction of theater in a capitalist consumer society? 
Um, so, as we've done in the last couple of days, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, the fabulous playwrights on the panel. Um, um, they are uh, Constance or Connie Comden. Um, Connie uh, is the honored playwright this year. Um, she has been called one of the best playwrights in our country and our language uh, that our language has ever produced by playwright Tony Kushner. Um, <laughs> it is true. Uh, her tales of the last four Mikans and other plays um, is a wonderful publication. Uh, many of us got to see that play last year. Um, uh, oh, pardon me, the Vindaloo, really. Um, Connie, why don't you say a few words about yourself? <laughs> I, I teach at Amherst College, which is a great gig. I'm playwright in residence, which means I don't have to go to any tenure meetings. <laughs> um, you're going to be seeing my play tonight called Take Me to the River. Um, and um, I'm just really happy to be here and be with some of my new friends and some of my extremely old friends like Mr. Wellman down there. <laughs> and, 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 and Mr. In there, and there are others of you out there. Okay. Great, thanks Connie. Uh, Connie also uh, is an alumna of New Dramatists and a member of the Dramatist Guild of America and uh, Penn. Then we have uh, Kate Snodgrass. Uh, Kate is the artistic director um, of the Elliot Norton and award-winning Boston Theater Marathon and Boston Playwrights Theater, uh, which is a home of new plays in Boston. Uh, she's the author of the Actors Theater of Louisville's Heidman award-winning play Haiku. Snodgrass has been recognized with two independent reviewers of New England Awards for Best New Play and a Steinberg Award nomination from the American Theater Critics Association. She's a professor of the practice of playwriting in the Boston University Graduate School and is a member of Actors' Equity Association, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, and the Dramatist Guild of America. She's been acknowledged by Boston Stage Source in 2001 as a theater hero. Stontgrass is a former national chair of playwriting at the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival and she received uh, their inaugural Milan Stitt Award as uh, an outstanding teacher of playwriting. Also awarded Boston's Elliot Norton Award for Sustained Excellence in 2012, and she is a playwriting fellow with the Huntington Theater Company. Uh, we also have Ruth Margraf uh, uh, to Kate's left. Um, Ruth has written uh, martial operas with Fred Ho for BAM's, last, uh, BAM's Not Last Wave, Next Wave Festival the Guggenheim Museum, Japan Society, Apollo, La Mama, and a CAMI, CAMI, uh, produced tour of performing art centers nationwide. She has toured with her Cafe Antarsia Ant Ensemble, thank you, and other places from Russia, India, Japan, Azerbaijan, and Egypt, and Chicago, Margraf's Anger Fly opened to critical acclaim at Trapdoor in 2001, uh, and Stadium, Devil Dare is running now at Red Tape, and uh, Theater Three Graces will open at Pivot Arts Festival this June, uh, and with other work at Chicago's uh, World Music Festival. She's received awards from the Rockefeller, McKnight, Jerome, and Fulbright, Fulbright Foundation, as well as numerous other uh, um, highly uh, enviable uh, accolades. Uh, Eric N, uh, uh, we have with us as well. Um, he recently completed a writing workshop with the Belarus Free Theater in Minsk, Belarus, in addition to producing the annual Arts in the One World Conference, which engages themes of art and social change, and conducts annual trips to Rwanda and Uganda so that students and professionals in the field can study the history of these countries and explore the ways that art influences recovery from violence. Uh, he has taught in universities across the country, including the University of Iowa, Naropa, University of California, San Diego, and University of Texas, Dallas. His plays have been produced in San Francisco, uh, Seattle, Austin, New York, Chicago, Belgrade, and elsewhere. Uh, and he's currently a professor at Brown University. Uh, yes. And then we have Mac Wellman. <coughs> who defies an introduction, but I'll do my best anyway. Uh, in addition to his many plays, including Three Twos or Afar, Bitter Bierce, Jenny Ritchie, and Anything's Dream, Macklemon has also written the novels The Fortune Teller, A Jest, Annie Salem, An American Tale, and Linda Perdi, 
Perdido. Perdido. Va bene. Um, his collections of poetry include Miniature, Strange, Elegies, Left Glove, and Split the Stick, the Miniature Divan. In addition to his Obie Awards, including the award for Best American Play for Bad Penny, Terminal Hip, and Crowbar, Bowman has received National Endowment for the Arts, New York Foundation for the Arts, Rockefeller, McKnight, and Guggenheim Fellowships, uh, a number of, of very impressive awards as well. Anyhow, so here we are at the T and the C, the capitalist and the theater, uh, uh, panel and me, I'm Eliza Bent. I'm no economist, but I do live in the United States, so I guess that makes me a consumer and a capitalist. Um, let's just get straight to work. Um, communism is dead. Capitalism is flawed. Uh, <laughs> life is short, brutish, and dark, or something like that. The Hobbes quote. How how does theater and capitalism, how do the two talk to each other? I'll start. Um, I have as bookmarks some checks I've gotten from William Morris, my former agent that's now William Morris Enterprises. One is for 43 cents. <laughs> one is for two dollars and two cents. And another one is, I think, about 34 dollars. I will eventually, you know, cash these because some <laughs> poor schmuck will have to trace me down if I don't. Um, <clears throat> that being said, um, the history of American theater is, is theater has always been a commercial enterprise because America is a commercial enterprise, and uh, so um, I think it's an uneasy. Um, Alliance, yeah, alliance, thank you. I was looking for the word there. Um, because theater does not make the money back it takes to produce it. Uh, in uh, Minneapolis, at Mixed Blood, Jack Rule has started a, just started giving, doing plays for free. Uh, the actors get paid, I believe. Uh, he has a budget, uh, he got funders to s step up to the plate. But the fact was that the, the ticket sales barely paid for the box off the running of the box office. So unless you bump the ticket sales way up, um, it's really hard to make the money back. Um, and so we get into this whole critic um, driven, um, New York Times criticism driven. Um, theater, which is commodity theater, and the regional theaters have become commodity theater uh, because they have to present plays to pay for their buildings, and of course the actors should be paid, and uh, the designers, and you know, you have to pay for the costumes, and somebody has to make them. Um, all of the enormous costs it takes to produce theater are not made up by ticket sales, unless the ticket sales are enormous. So, I didn't see The Lion King, even though I had two close friends in it, because there were no comps, and because the tickets were, I think, $150, and that, in my life, is four or maybe five new plays I could see, which I'd rather spend my money on. Okay, that's my, oh, and I want to thank all the funding throughout my life that's allowed me to continue as a, as a playwright. The Rockefellers, the, I, I, the W. Alton Jones, um, the Albert P. Sloan, all of these uh, corporations sometimes who are using it as guilt money, whatever, I'm happy to have the money, and that's really, uh, that's really kept, kept me alive, and the theaters produce my work going. So theater functioning in a capitalist society, I, I feel like I should probably amend that, that question a bit. I don't know if I asked it in a clear enough manner. Well, this is, this is more of, about the uh, malfunction, but <laughs> that's fine too. I do have some things to say about the function, but um, it seems like every um, five years or so, I end up shaking my fist um, at capitalism and um, in some kind of article, and um, when I looked at the question, I thought about an article that I read that I wrote in uh, 
a 2002 book called Theater in Crisis that Peridot Switch published. And Eric, um, she actually, in the introduction, writes that Eric and I, and I'm sure she includes Mac as well, I think you guys are all in the same anthology, of passionately and fearlessly breaking down the walls of holy commerce. So I think by now they should be gone. <laughs> But um, anyway, in that um, manifesto, I tried to unfurl Robinson Crusoe as the father of all of our stories and the plots of all of our plays and as a self-absorbed island of imperialist conquering of time and space. And I tried to create a Girl Friday as the protagonist with a parrot who could speak um, Crusoe English on her shoulder. And my title was, um, and I'm just going to read a little bit from this toward an evangelical capitalist message in a bottle to the next millennium of Robinson Crusoe's in proscenium, which is all the rest of the playwrights. <laughs> um, what if someday this Girl Friday type of figment rib were to wake up in a state of omnipregnant omniscience that would rise above the wilderness of melodies in the third act? What if she could read from east to western gold rush? What if she had a far sight further than the 15-minute killing spree ejaculation sold to us evangelically by the same old likely cross we lust and gamble for in every pop star? What if it's too hard? What if we give up? What if she starts writing what we can't possess at all? To dumb it down, pointless, it's an act of oppression to write our characters in Crusoe English, first word, master, with our foot placed firmly on Friday's head. Any play with a blurbable single meaning valued at the ticket price makes a jump deposit. These plays are childless. These plays are uninhabited. Shut your eyes, the Crusoe's murmur to the parrot, because it's very green here. Girl Friday, green? But in the pitch dark, everything is black and white, like an old film. You only know it's green because you recognize the shapes, or maybe velvet, and they say it feels like velvet, too. And the parrot says, oh, I always wondered what it felt like. Velvet? And they hesitate a little on the way and tip the parrot back into the night until it feels a coarseness holding it up, which used to be a tree. Evangelism. The, uh, a priest was saying in church the other day that um, he asked the question: that If if a shark eats a baby, does the shark sin? And he said, No, the shark doesn't sin. The shark is just fulfilling its nature. Um, we don't understand why the shark was given its nature, but it's not sinning if it fulfills its nature. So capitalism is just fine, like a thunderstorm or a shark is fine, and a thunderstorm will wipe out your neighborhood and, and flood it, it, it will kill your children. Cap capitalism uh, uh, gets things done, but its nature is, is really indifferent to you and your happiness. It's capitalism serves capitalism. And in the wake of that, it can also serve theater. Um, uh, but it has nothing to do with the making of meaning. It has to do with the making of money. And the making of meaning is people in Congress with each other reflecting deeply to no purpose. Um, it's being alive, alive to each other. And that has absolutely nothing to do with capitalism per se, which wants, mon which wants money. And money is fine. Money gave us these microphones. It's, a, it's really, I don't have, I used to rail against capitalism, but, but it's like railing against sharks. But it, let it continue to eat the babies of the world. I'll just try to keep my babies out of that water, for example. I'll, I'll look for the, for the fins. So I look for alternatives to the capitalist system and try to build my life around the making of meaning, indifferent to outcome and certainly indifferent to money. I think uh, it's been said often that every exchange of money is a failure of hospitality. Every time you have to give someone a dollar for a pack of gum, it means that you don't know each other well enough to have a free free exchange of goods, a direct exchange of, of goods. Um, I'll also say that theater is ultimately doesn't matter and can be as full of 
of guilt and can uh, uh, be as, as brutal as capitalism can be. The making, the making of meaning can be precious or irrelevant or uh, biased or, or cruel. Um, theater artists have been involved in, in genocides and repression through, throughout time. Uh, dictators often align themselves with artists because artists are as useful to the control of the population as, as the control of capital is. All that really matters, or what matters absolutely, is everything and nothing. And capitalism and art are equidistant from everything and nothing. And they aspire to both, that there be nothing in opposition to capitalism and that capital own everything is, seems to be aspirational. That theater be able to reach into both disaster and, and heavenly chaos seems to be aspirational. So uh, in the middle of this grid, I, I will separate myself from capitalism as best I can, not because it's evil, but because it's irrelevant to my purposes. Can you talk a little bit more about the alternative models and uh, that you seek out, if, uh, despite living in a capitalist world? Um, uh, well, uh, as, as per the Catholic worker, you don't sign written contracts. Um, uh, uh, avoid avoid payment. I never ask about money, and sometimes it hap sometimes it happens that money comes. Um, uh, and uh, pursue projects without outcome or that that are only inappropriately assessed. Uh, so I like plays that don't mean any, you know, that don't deliver meaning like a commodity, but open up the possibility of making meaning. So. We, you bring people together through the, through the trauma of a play to a crisis of indecisiveness. And that, that percolation of a community um, uh, desperate for meaning and not in possession of it, that's, what I want, that's exactly where I want a play to end up, uh, just prior to the moment of possessing meaning. Because as soon as you possess it, you can market it. Um, I want to preface my remarks by stating that I intend to be the first off-off-Broadway billionaire. <laughs> I, I think if you read Adam Smith, uh, he's not so different from Karl Marx. Uh, capitalism as originally invented and construed is not a wicked, awful uh, set of theses. Uh, I do think something has happened in the last 30, 40 years. Uh, corporate culture in this country has become uh, distinctly disturbing. <clears throat> uh, my own feeling is that this move to the right is not the fault of the Republican Party, it's the fault of the Democratic Party, particularly the Carter-Clinton wing, which moved deliberately to the right. <clears throat> we don't have the language to talk about politics anymore. <clears throat> uh, most good journalists are losing their jobs. Um, I don't think theater has done a particularly good job of addressing political issues uh, in a very, very long time. It doesn't have the vocabulary for it. People don't have the knowledge uh, and distance from it. Uh, I agree with Eric that we tend to produce a message art, um, which ends up in the horrible realm of the already known. The thing that's dangerous and uh, provocative about theater is that it's a stupid, low-income <clears throat> craft. It's, it's about people in a room, or God help us outside in the rain with Connie. <laughs> um, and that's what makes it provocative and dangerous. Um, you can trace the history of theater very neatly uh, by tracing uh, the opinions of the people that hated theater, going back to Plato, <clears throat> the Christian fathers, Augustine, <clears throat> right down to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, it's also interesting that every new development in uh, theater comes from people saying, I don't want to do that old shit anymore. I want to do something new. So anti-theatricalism also gives rise to new things. Um, I think it's a very tricky time right now because there's, there's not uh, many ways of communicating with each other or for us to communicate with the public at large. And that is a big problem. Uh, 
when I think about capitalism, uh, I uh, think about the people I know and playwrights in this business, so-called business. Um, and uh, uh, you know what uh, Mac and Eric are saying about uh, it, it brings it down to the individual writer. And what I, I think in terms of years ago, I uh, worked over in Cambridge and went a little bit with Robert Brewstein, and he was mad at me at one point because I was a young teacher and. I, I had a friend who was making a very good living uh, writing screenplays, and I wanted him to come and talk to the class and tell them, you know, regale them with stories. And uh, Bob was really upset with me because he did not want me to encourage in any way a playwright to go to Hollywood, which, believe me, I, I agree up to a point. Uh, you know, we, we live in a cap, we live in the United States where we want to make a living and want to pay our rent. And we can't do that. So there's a conundrum there. And uh, it comes down, for me, it comes down to we have to be very, very, very careful. Because if there's a little preposition, two prepositions. We are either, like in Hollywood, writing for an audience where we want to make money, we want to uh, uh, have people come and see our movies, and we're writing for a specific Connect, uh, uh, to connect to a certain uh, demographic. And in the theater, I hope we are writing to an audience. So we are writing to communicate something that we all share. And it's very different. One is, can be very lucrative, but it also uh, it's, it's, it introduces you to the devil. Because then we somehow think that it's the same thing. And it's not. And if, if we do start writing for an audience, it seems to me that um, what capitalism encourages us, us to do is then, then we go down the road where we are lost, all of us, in terms of, of just our souls, if I may be so silly. Um, <clears throat> I want to uh, say something that's good about Hollywood, and but I would also New York and that, I actually encourage my students to think about writing for cable television. And I don't mean, uh, like, I, you know what I mean, HBO, Showtime, etc. Some of the best writing in America actually is on those shows. Um, I've had students do well there. And um, Mac and I have an old friend, well Mac has a really, really good friend. I have a person that I had a complicated relationship with, Eric Overmeyer, who, who's, um, whom I admire tremendously, who was a pioneer in changing the, the quality of the writing on cable. So you can find really wonderful writing on cable, and you can find people who write for that and also write plays. Um, as far as um, a theater not doing a good job, I would say that it's really, it, it, they're, they're, when we talk about theater, we're talking about, well, a lot of people, but we're talking about the people who actually make it, who write it, and then we're talking about the people who choose the plays that get produced. I certainly know lots of work that is uh, political in the best sense of the word, but y you know, you, it doesn't get produced, or if it does, it's in what I believe has kept me alive as this small network, well actually it's large, because I think it's hundreds of theaters all over the United States who produce new plays. And there you find a voice that's uh, critical. Um, and, uh, and I mean critique in terms of apologia, apology, explanation, as well as being critical of, um, what's going on, what we would call political theater. These are not the plays you're, you're going to see, for the most part, in New York City. You're not gonna see them. You're not gonna see them in regional theater, which is a commodity theater, as I mentioned before. They have huge budgets, and they have huge expenses. So, the, but the, you know, America is about, America's a capitalistic country. It's aside from a small period of history where we had the barter system, it's really been about the making of money. 
and uh, I, I don't have any problems with the making of money. Uh, I think it's a good thing. I, I hope to make more before I die. The problem is greed. And um, in, uh, in socialistic societies, uh, the problem is still greed. That's the problem. I think capitalism as a system works, uh, in terms of what works, works pretty well. Um, socialism and communism haven't really been tried in their purest form, so I can't really make a judgment. Certainly a mixture of socialistic principles and capital in a capitalistic system, that seems to work okay. Uh, I, um, I'm gonna stop there, thank you. And I wanna clarify that I said, I don't mean, I'm not telling everybody not to go to Hollywood and make money, I'm just saying we all need to know the difference. Well, I think it's all, it's all part of a continuum that has non-commercial art at one end of it and this very highly commercial art at the other side. And I think we all need both sides. And what's interesting to me about the visual art world is that the space of um, painting has um, lost its dependence on the figurative or the kind of, not the uh, prefigurative human being that is representational and also the line of the horizon that is um, mirroring back reality to the viewer. But theater still has um, these two forms of what is figurative or real and then the horizon line of time. And I think that, um, I mean, I think it's interesting that I do commercial projects. I, I have made money somehow in the theater um, and yet I'm constantly pushing the form and I think that that's part of capitalism because those innovative margins and, and thresholds and, and vanguards of the form are where all the ideas eventually trickle up to the places that make money. My problem with capitalism is that the people that are sometimes make, making the work, generating the ideas, and um, doing the labor are not getting the money. So I would like to see it trickle down a little more, and I don't think it's it's trickling down in capitalism. So I think we need a new model. I mean, I, I think, you know, Connie's right. Uh, socialism, when I read Marx, it sounds like a poem, you know? It, I don't know, it ha and if it hasn't worked yet, how is that gonna work? So I would like it to work, and I'd like somebody to come up with a better plan, but I think that they can actually, the capitalists can look to the artist because we're both entrepreneurial and we are making this art and theater is really in between because we've got um, people collaborating and, and sharing, like Eric's saying, the hospitable um, bartering of services and spaces and time. And we also are somehow able to survive as an art form so I guess what I would like to see happen more in theater is more like what's happening in the art world where somebody like uh, Rem Koolhaas, who's an architect, can say luxury is rough, you know? So if where everything in the world is smooth, art is rough. And if things are common, art is uncommon, art is unique. So my question is, why is it that people that are, are really stirring up trouble at the margins of uh, the form, why are they not in the luxury of the form? And I think they are in the art world in a lot of times, and they are sometimes in architecture and other fields, science. Um, so why, um, why aren't we honoring the, those margins and really looking to them as fertile crescents of, of uh, productive work and I think okay the university does and I think even television does television is attracting a lot of our great writers and and there is really great writing on television um, somebody needs to write a new 30 rock in office because those are now gone but, <laughs> but so I don't think we're we're trying to say you know I don't tell my students either not to write for Hollywood because they've got to make a living they've got to also figure out a way within the system to pay their rent. So we are, as artists, very resourceful and entrepreneurial in finding those little tiny bits of money under every rock, or some rocks at least. We have a, a, a very short amount of, oh please, no. Uh, my first plays were actually done in the Netherlands, which 
particularly then was a socialist state. Uh, the thing I found impressive about Harlem then, and I still do now, was the extent to which people living there have what I would call institutional imagination, the thing that we sadly lack in this country. Uh, we have one idea of how to structure <coughs> institutions, and that's corporate institutions. Uh, uh, when I applied for a grant from the Amsterdam City Council to do a play, the committee met. The committee does not meet unless there's a proposal. There are no application forms. I had to make my own uh, application. We made a big cover in the book with the script in it. <laughs> Three quarters of the money went to an insurance policy, which meant the show could not fail. It traveled for six months all over the Benelux country. There's nothing like that in this country because we do not, do not question forms, institutional forms of any kind. And that I find appalling. We, al we also don't argue about anything. Americans are very good people. We do as, our, as we are told. And that's true as much on the left as on the right. Well, let's get into some more arguments, shall we? And open, up the, um, <laughs> open it up to some questions, comments, debates, concerns, diatribes, etc. Yeah. The panel uh, that I spoke to the other day about you know, the impact of the internet on theater, I'd like to go a little bit further and ask the panel to, um, to comment on the phenomenon uh, of the, the new kind of funding mechanism of crowdfunding, such as Kickstarter. Uh, I know two theater companies that have done quite well in getting projects launched using that rather innovative and new uh, form of uh, raising money. Anybody up there have any uh, thoughts about that and maybe the future of crowdfunding? Uh, I think it's great. I think it's successful. Connie thinks it's great. <laughs> Eric has something more concrete to say, and please give that man the mic before he has a heart attack. Eric, you go. No, I'm done. I want to be a little disruptive, a, a little sort of impolite. Uh, personally, I'd say to people here, as, as the people of the panel and myself, I'm a lifelong Marxist, um, uh, so I don't know that much about capitalism. Neither the people of the panel. I urge all of you to go read about it. Find out as much as you can about it. Because it's an important subject. You're living in the midst of it, and you're swallowed up by it. So learn about it. We don't all know about it, but you can learn about it. Uh, the fact that we talk about capitalism and haven't mentioned class shows the fact we don't know much about capitalism here. Capitalism is be about class and the separation by the ownership of, 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 of basic things in life. That's what capitalism is. It's not just money. It's only the factories, it's only the land, it's only the resources, the mines, the labor. That's what spends money. It's ownership of the way in which we stay alive. So I want you to learn about that. I also, with all due respect to my fellow uh, Ivy Leaguer, um, I think we're mystifying it. We're talking about it. It's like a shark. It's mystifying it. It's created by human beings. Uh, sharks are not created by human beings, as far as I understand. <laughs> uh, uh, these, these structures of living and ownership and all that, you can just trace it historically back to the 17th and 18th century as the aristocratic class collapses of its own weight and the bourgeoisie moves in and creates laws that allows it to own things until it now owns everything. The United States is probably now a very successful capitalist country. Maybe 30% of people, 35% are in poverty or just barely out of it, trying to stay out of it. And that's a success. It's not success. It needs to be challenged. Two final observations. Bao said a great thing. Mao Zedong. He said. He said changes will happen in art when it's not a matter of what you do, but for whom, with whom, and to whom. Now the women's movement is an example of this. Women began to make theater for women, African American people, made for African American people, Latinos for Latinos, workers for workers. That's how it changed, <coughs> finding new people to dialogue with and not creating it as the mind of, here you go, not, not to be a heretic, out of the individual single, a single playwright, but out of a community of people who were in dialogue about their stories. 
It's, a, it's, a, it's another model. Who's doing that right now? It's a group of belong, the theater of the oppressed, in which you work the community. You don't come in as you know it all. The theater doesn't know that much about politics, you're right, or about how to change things or makes things different. They don't know much about that. But we do know how to make structures that can help other people tell their stories. And, and in that sense, what Buol is challenging is, is the individual performance coming from the stage in a monologue and coercing people to think and believe and feel certain things. It's a profound challenge that Buol is offering. And I, I think it would be good at the, the Great Plains Theater Conference sort of took that up as something to think about in the future. Thank you very much, I'm done with my just, just heart one, uh, Just one <laughs> argument, uh, one point of debate. Um, yeah, it's really great debate. what you said. Um, I did have class be between Robinson Crusoe with his foot on Friday's head and also the parrot. I just didn't call it class. class. <laughs> Um, I, I want to add, you know, that there actually is quite a lot of theater that does what you uh, so eloquently talk about, sir. And um, and uh, class is becoming more important uh, than race in this country or gender. However, I still love to go to a play and have people on stage uh, pretending and. Um, enjoy myself and I even like plays that were written 400 to 2,000 years ago so um, I, I do know that I then am surrounded by people who can pay for that and that's a very different experience than what Boal wanted to do and what communities are doing and what we've done a bit at this conference I just want to add that my father was a welder and a union man and one of the things that we in the theater always have to deal with when it comes to community theater is um, that in the so-called professional theater we have actors equity and we have the stagehand union and those people need to be paid, should be paid, but of course that is a large expense. Community theater is um, amateur theater, which I believe in, theater for the love of it, and it has an extremely important part in our uh, present and I hope future. I know my students are very, very interested in doing it, and I know there are a lot of young companies that are doing it that are going out in the communities, and uh, I think that's a tremendous part of, of theater in any country. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. We barely even touched class, but so it goes um, when you have a, a short amount of time. Yeah, thanks for everyone's uh, comments and feedback.